Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast, Season 23, Episode 6, The Battle of Warringen, Part 2. This episode was written by Thomas E. Spremont. Thomas has a BS in computer-aided design as well as an MS in software engineering. His lifelong interest in history prompted him to earn an MA in history from the California State University Fullerton. His thesis addressed Roman financial and economic agency. He has published four history articles covering topics from ancient Rome, the medieval period, pre-modern Europe and modern intellectual history. His primary interests in history are Greek and Roman engineering, the Low Countries during the pre-modern period, and ancient warfare. At the end of part one we reached the point where Jean had marched to the town of Warringen, where he besieged Siegfried's fortified tower. The archbishop believed him to be at a military disadvantage because he'd advanced so far into enemy territory and therefore Siegfried mustered as many of his troops and allies as he could and moved south to Brauweiler in order to cut off the Duke's supply lines from Cologne. On the morning of June the 5th, Siegfried conducted mass and excommunicated Duke Jean. He moved his troops northeast towards Warringen along with those of the Counts of Luxembourg and Gelders. Van Helu stated that the combined armies of Siegfried seemed imposing, and it is likely that Siegfried had five hundred more mounted men than Jean's forces, a considerable advantage. The Duke's infantry exceeded his enemies by perhaps a thousand due to the peasant contingent from Berg and townsmen from Cologne. In medieval warfare, the larger cavalry typically won the day. Modern estimates propose Jean's cavalry at 1,500 and his infantry at 2,500. Jean mustered his forces, then attended mass. He wore his own coat of arms, a gold lion on a black shield, dispensing with the common practice of having another knight wear it. This trickery allowed lords to escape unnoticed if the need arose, thus avoiding capture. Identifying friend and foe was critical for the knights, who wore blazel and carried pennants. Combatants, both as groups and individuals, relied upon banners for direction. Field commanders used these devices to communicate action. Knights gathered, aligned, charged, halted, rallied or regrouped under their own banner movements, or those whom they accompanied. Mounted warriors and infantry would not advance nor straggle behind their units. A group of mounted warriors protected each banner, ensuring it continued to fly, and raised a spare when necessary. Banners provided rallying points in the hectic and confusing fever of battle when knights became separated. When one side's banners went down and none re-raised, then soldiers rallied to their allies. Once all flags were down, this signalled the knights to seek refuge and released them from the field without dishonour, for the battle was then over. At least thirty banners flew under the Duke of Brabant, and probably more under the Archbishop. Jean moved his army eight hundred metres south from his allies' camp on a slight rise that led down to level ground between the roads to Cologne and Merkenich, taking up the centre. Traditional adversaries faced each other. The counts of Lamarck and Berg, along with the Cologne levy, took up position on the east side of the Merkinic Road, covering Duke's left flank. The Counts of Ulich and Luz made up the right flank, facing the Count of Gelders. Duke Jean's centre division of Brabantsons would battle Count Henry of Luxembourg. As the Count of Berg and his peasant contingent came into the Archbishop's view, Siegfried turned his forces north to meet his main enemy. Around nine o'clock, with trumpets sounding, the heavy cavalry clashed. Siegfried's heavy charge broke through the lines of Berg and Lamarck, causing many casualties. Adolf retreated 3,000 metres north, where he regrouped near the tower. Rather than pursue Adolf of Berg, Siegfried turned west to attack Duke Jean's group. The archbishop knew this would break his enemy's centre. 
In order to reach the forces of Brabant, the archbishop's heavy cavalry crossed the Merkinic road, requiring his cavalry to dismount in order to navigate the ditches and ravines, breaking their formation. Count Robert of Vernonborg, charged as field marshal, advised John to attack Siegfried before his forces remounted, as they would be easy prey for the Duke's mounted knights. Jean ignored this sound tactical advice, and decided to take Siegfried head-on in the field, between the two roads, in knightly fashion. The numerically superior forces of the archbishop forced Jean to decide whether to thin out his line to avoid encirclement, or to close ranks, preventing a breakthrough. Although his military leaders were at odds, Jean chose to close ranks and charged downhill. Henry VI of Luxembourg held Siegfried's centre. Conrad de Lonson, chief of the powerful and wealthy Scavedris family, fought by Henry's side. He led more than a hundred Scavedris knights, all seeking their sworn enemies the Mulrapas. However, the Mulrapas caught wind that the Scavedris wanted their blood and decided to remain far behind the Duke's front lines in order to be fresh when they faced their mortal foes. Instead, the Scavedris attacked the Duke's brother, Godfrey, driving him back with the force of their charge. Tightening their formation, other Brabants and warriors raced to Godfrey's support to avoid a defeat. As the Brabant fighters at the front lines became wounded and fatigued, others moved up until they recovered, and so Jean's army skilfully fought Henry's forces. Count Reinhold of Gelder's army moved westwards in order to attack the Duke's right flank of Ulich and Luz. Their charge broke through the weaker ranks, stumbling into the enemy camp. Thinking they'd won, the soldiers plundered it, but the mounted camp guards routed them. The Count's men then fled, reducing their ranks. The Duke's warriors, under strict orders, maintained their type fighting formation and did not chase the looters. Godfrey eventually gained the upper hand and broke the line of Count Henry, exposing the banner of Luxembourg. Jean of Brabant pressed towards his foe, but the thick of battle prevented a full-on charge. Henry and a few of his knights redoubled their efforts to penetrate the crowded melee to engage the Duke and broke through, wounding Jean and killing his steed. The Count's men downed the horse of Jean's standard-bearer, Rasta Grey, who, along with Jean, tumbled to the ground in the tumult. With the banner of Brabant down, their trumpets ceased, giving a panicked pause to the fighters, but a second banner-bearer stepped up and unfurled the Duke's arms of a gold lion on a black background. Once again Brabant's trumpet sounded, alerting the Brabantsons to continue the fight. Jean, enmeshed in ground combat, forced his way back to the road where he could retrieve another horse and gather his men to him. Once equipped, he led twenty knights back into the field, charging directly to Henry's banner, where he threw it to the ground, disrupting his enemy's troops. The Count of Luxembourg charged the Duke, but his own mount was speared by one of the Duke's warriors. Henry, grappling the Duke, meant to unhorse him, but in doing so made himself vulnerable, and Vautier Bisdom struck him a mortal blow with his lance. As Henry died, along with three of his brothers, his forces collapsed. By three o'clock Siegfried seemed all but victorious against the Duke's centre. At this time Adolf of Berg made a decisive move. He led the cavalry and the Cologne levy, along with his peasant militia, back down the Merkinic road and re-centred the battlefield, flanking the archbishop on his right and rear. This fight exemplifies changes in warfare, as commoners not only participated in the fight, but were well prepared. The peasants of Berg wore gambesons, a padded defensive jacket, beaconils, or metal helmets, and some even wore plate armour. For weapons, many wielded gurdendags, heavy spiked clubs. Cologne citizens were even better accoutred, wearing chainmail, plate armour, and wielded swords and halberks. As the townsmen and peasants entered the field, they killed all they encountered, driven by a hatred, cultivated with years of rape and pillage across their lands. 
Decades of animosity between the second and third orders seemed to blind the peasants to their real foe, the Archbishop of Cologne. These commoners had no head for coats of arms. They could not distinguish friend from foe on a field of thousands. Batel, a light cavalryman from Brabant, witnessed the carnage the peasants caused, and gathered them to him, and then led them to the rear flank of the archbishop's army. Now, properly focused on their real enemy, they killed at will, using their clubs with deadly force. Siegfried, now flanked on three sides by the duke, the count of Berg, and the peasant militia, knew that his fight was over. He thought it better to surrender himself for ransom than to end up on the business end of a Godendag. Too far away to give himself up to Godfrey, he found the closest noble instead, his enemy, the Count of Berg. Adolf removed Siegfried from the battlefield, then imprisoned him in his fortress at Monheim. The archbishop's unit, protecting his massive wooden banner wagon, eventually collapsed, and the commoners from Berg tore it down and continued their murderous rampage, killing all in their way, both men and horses, taking their bloody revenge on the archbishop and looting his forces. With the Count of Luxembourg dead and Siegfried defeated, Count Reinhold of Gelders continued to fight against the Counts of Ulich and Luz on the right flank of the Duke's army. Eventually Reinhold's ranks broke against his enemy's forces. The Gelders' banner fell, and the Brabantsons took Count Reinhold prisoner. Valram van Valkenburg fought on in the Gelders' centre, rallying the Count's men around him, then charging the banner of Ulich. Both men were wounded in the charge, but eventually Ulich's knights overcame the last resistance of Gelders' forces. The final conflict of the day occurred about four o'clock in the afternoon between two Limburg clans, the Scavedris and the Mulrepas. They used the War of Succession to carry out their hereditary vendetta. In 1287, Count Reinhold of Gelders awarded Conrad de Lonson the official title of Seneschal, dismissing Heinrich von Mulrepas from his post. The Count refused to pay a debt, the Mulrepas claimed, causing great enmity. The Mulrepas, with aid from their relative, the Vitams, killed all the Scavedri knights who were exhausted from hours of combat. According to Van Hilu, these two clans were the best warriors on the field of battle. He lamented the unfortunate circumstances that the brave Limbourgeois fought each other as brothers. By five o'clock the entire battle was over, and the Duke of Brabant had won. Van Hilu recorded eleven hundred dead among Siegfried's forces, and only forty on the side of Brabant. The losses on the Duke's side reflect the chronicler's bias, but Jean certainly had fewer losses than Siegfried, but still these must have numbered in the hundreds. These casualties attest to the combatants' fierce level of fighting throughout the day. The Aftermath, Continuity and Change The Duke of Brabant won the battle, giving him the rights to Limburg, but at a price. The terrors executed during the War of Succession caused repercussions throughout Christendom. All princes intervened to end this bloody quarrel, as the Duke had yet to be recognised as Lord of Limburg. Through reparations and litigation, Jean was legally in control of Old Lower Lotharangia by 1289. This elevated his prestige, not just locally, but throughout France, the Holy Roman Empire, and as far away as England. The battle permanently separated the lands west of the Rhine from the Holy Roman Empire. Of the great feudal houses of Belgium, Brabant was the sole survivor after the 13th century. The losses suffered by the House of Luxembourg ensured they would never acquire Limburg. A decade later, the Luxembourg dynasty was still trying to recover from the devastating battle loss to Brabant, as a generation of men from this house died on the battlefield in 1288. The Cologne auxiliaries, combined with the peasants of Berg, turned out to be a critical factor in the Duke of Brabant's victory. The combination of craft and money flowing through Cologne equipped peasants and townsmen to fight, but Van Helu's rendition treats this occurrence as no surprise. 
common men fought alongside free soldiers and knights as a matter of course so was not unique to this battle the commoners good and dags required little or no training to use and were very effective against armoured knights the citizens of cologne did not experience immediate relief of the long-established control of the archbishops but signed a treaty of pacification with siegfried on june eighteenth twelve eighty nine the loss suffered by siegfried eventually led to the weakening of the high clergy over the urbanites and the archbishops ceased to intervene in counties on the lower rhine their power permanently broken by jean I. by the end of the middle ages the third order consisted of powerful patricians merchants guilds and wealthy bourgeoisie all contributing to the weakening of the old socio-political institutions developed during the ninth and tenth centuries although the nobility continued to be appointed as archbishops in cologne for centuries to come the connection between the guilds burghers trades merchants and secular administration ended in new-found capabilities of the free citizens it was not until fourteen seventy five a hundred and eighty seven years after the battle of warringen that cologne became an herbs imperialis libera or free imperial city subordinate only to the holy roman emperor the citizens finally shed their hereditary overlords the feud between the scavedris and the Mulrapas might have been blood-quenched, but in fact the Scavedri's clan was large enough to survive extinction. Historian Paul Herve reports that out of a 110 Scavedri's knights engaged in the conflict, only four escaped death or capture, including Conrad de Lonson. However, clan members still occupied fortresses throughout Limburg, and they took the names of these domains as their own in the manner of the old nobility. Three branches of the Scavedri's line remained, which constituted a total of twenty-seven families, all bearing the name of their fiefs. In 1290 the Duke of Brabant sought to restore peace to Limburg by reconciling these two feuding families and pardoning his personal enemies brought about by the war. Van Helu identified the tension between the combat behaviour of individual knights and their resistance to conforming to battlefield tactics, particularly on Siegfried's side. This demonstrates continuity with the past, beginning with the Crusades, when knights generally acted as individuals, even on the battlefield. This battle confirmed that knights formed and fought as units, but at times broke ranks to execute personal grudges but warringen also became a harbinger of change a combined discipline to battlefield order that superseded the individual the tactics executed by the duke of brabant showed how groups under separate banners could not only act as units but apply strategy and win the day the time of heavy cavalry as the winning factor was waning the armed peasants and citizens played a deciding role in Jean of Brabant's decisive victory, proving their value in battle. These social, political and religious forces set the stage for pre-modern Europe. State formation and the rising power of the Third Order affected the shift in economics. Counts, dukes and princes continued to consolidate their power, slowly obsoleting the vassal military paradigm. By the end of the Middle Ages, armies became professional, well-trained institutions that protected the rise and stability of European politics. Due to these socio-political developments, the Battle of Warringen was the last conflict of its kind. Don't forget, you could write a script for us too, if you like, and don't be daunted about doing that, because we are here to help. If you've got an idea for a podcast script, and you'd really like to get one written, but you're not quite sure where to start or how to go about it, then just drop us a line and we'll be glad to answer your questions and even give you a hand in getting it done. Or if you've got a subject that you'd like to see us cover, then just drop us a line as well. It's info at thehistorynetwork.org for all of those. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by Thomas E. Spremont read by Nick Barker.